All right, so we get to talk about the patient condition and pathology, and uh, I'll turn the lights off a little bit so we can see a little bit better. Of course, in this lecture, I put my spin on it because we talk about you know, x-ray parameters and, and KV and what to do with different types of patients. So we'll start off pretty easy. You never know what the condition of a patient is going to be, right? Um, right now, we're not even dealing with patients. So one of the things I saw in the lab today and I've seen before, uh, you have to start getting into the practice of placing your phantoms as if it were a real patient. So for instance, if you have a phantom foot, the toes should not be facing you, right, on the table. They should be kind of the toes should be at the end of the table facing this way as if there was a patient body in their head at the end, right? Um, well, there, there's only so much dorsiflexing you could do with, with the phantoms. But, um, you know, I saw someone this morning with the pelvis, you know, the pelvis was facing them kind of, which meant that if it was a patient body, their head would have been over the table, the width wise instead of the length wise. So you have to start getting in the practice of, you know, putting it where it actually really would be not where it just kind of seems to be convenient. It'll also change the way the beam is diverging. I mean, the beam will diverge the same way, but it would go through the phantom completely differently than it would a normal pelvis. And it's also not set up that way for the bucky that's underneath. So you never know what kind of patient you're gonna get. Um, all you can try to do is look at the requisition before you see the patient, maybe somehow get a peek of the patient, maybe pull up previous images that you might be able, if you have access to PACS, um, a lot of times you just don't know. But preparation is key. Have your technique set up uh, in advance. Have all your cassettes, if you're not using flat panel detectors, set up um, so that you kind of do everything you need to do before the patient even gets in there, at least as much as you possibly can. And then maybe you'll only have minor adjustments I mean, something to know is, can the patient stand, right? That's going to be a big difference. Is the patient in a wheelchair? Can they get up out of the wheelchair? Are they in a stretcher? Are you even allowed to take them off the stretcher if they're in a stretcher? Some places say no, but some places use stretchers when they can't find a wheelchair. So it's kind of, you know. Um, calipers, have you seen these in the lab? We have, we have a few of them. Um, they're very good at taking the thickness of an object so they can help you figure out your technique uh, and what your KV uh, should be. The only problem with calipers is they don't assess the pathology that's inside the patient. So if you have clone of me, right, I might measure the same, both of us, but if one has, you know, a big, this would be terrible, big tumor in them, you know, then you're going to have uh, a different amount of radiation necessary to penetrate that. So this is only going to give you from kind of A to Z without, and skip the rest of the alphabet. Uh, but in terms of weight and height, not really useful for us. Right? Um, MRI, we take weight into consideration, but not in uh, CT really, other than if they're too heavy for the table. Um, but an x-ray weight uh, is not really a concern. It's more of thickness. And lucky for us, we can say that 85 to 90% of patients, basically humans, uh, fall into pretty much average categories without too much change. So if you have a good technique for an adult ankle, you're probably going up just a little bit for someone that's a little bit bigger and maybe just a little bit down from there, but it's not going to vary that widely. We'll talk about abdominal work, which does vary more than something like any kind of extremity. So the extremities don't change all that much. And you can see these percentages, uh, especially for the upper extremities are pretty high. Things get a little bit different. Uh, in the shoulder, in, uh, and then for lower extremities, but not even the foot and the ankle, more for like th 
thigh, knee, and leg. Which makes sense, right? Some people are chunky over here and some people not so, right? Hands, you know, unless you have Andre the Giant hands, right, or something really, really different, most people are going to fall into uh, a pretty good average. So there's the 4CM rule. I didn't make this rule up, um, but it essentially says if you have a technique that works for a particular thickness, if that thickness becomes four centimeters bigger, for example, and you already have a good technique, that approximately you should double your exposure if you go up by four centimeters, or half your exposure if you go down by four centimeters. So it's more like a rule of thumb. Right? Because again, you don't really know what the pathology is that maybe is increasing the size. Right? You know, there's a difference between someone's ankle being larger because it is versus someone's ankle being larger because it's swollen and there's edema because they just fractured something. Right? Uh, because the edema is, is fluid and you know, someone that just happens to have a larger ankle is just because of you know, soft tissue and muscle and that kind of thing. <clears throat> this just looked interesting. I don't know what this is supposed to be. Right. Um, so to build on the last slide, if we know we're going to double the exposure, one nice way to do it is to just go up 15% in your KV. Um, that's not going up, you know, 50% in KV, right? So it's a moderate increase in KV that will double the exposure. It'll lead to less patient exposure because you'll have less photoelectric effect. Um, so it's a good way to do it. Um, you could go up in mass, you could double your mass, but better to double your KV uh, because that way you can lower the mass yeah, that way you could lower the time and help avoid motion. So KV is the better choice, uh, I think. That'll allow you to decrease the time. Easy so far? So this is something you could do on your own. Uh, hopefully you guys are already kind of putting something like this together a little bit for your quiz that's coming up. Uh, I don't think anyone's ever gotten in trouble at an institution for kind of having some techniques written on a piece of paper, right? Um, some people have gotten in trouble if you look at your cell phone and then people are like, what are you doing looking at your cell phone? And they don't realize that you're, you know, not surfing social media and that you're actually looking at, you know, a technique chart that happens to be on your phone. Hopefully, more and more in the future, people will not immediately have some negative connotation when they see a technologist whip out their cell phone, right? But nowadays, it still looks bad. But maybe that'll change over time. Can you do it twice? I'm not up to that part. What is the minimum change? So. I can't tell you, and you'll, this is going to happen to you. So you're going to set your technique, and you're going to ask one of the technologists, does this look okay before you make the exposure? Because you know you're, and they'll go and they'll change the KD from like 78 to 80. That's not really going to make a difference. Um, that might make them feel better. So some people just change things because they think it will actually change things. Uh, and other people just feel like they have to change something because they're the technologist and you're a student. I don't know. The actual rule is you need about a 35% change in mass if you're going to see a noticeable change in the image. Or at least a 5% change in KV. So if you have 80 KV, 
uh, they have to change it by at least 4 kV to make a difference. 2 kV, not so much. Right? Let's do the math for a second. 80 kV, a 10% change would be 8, a 5% change would be 4. So unless they change it by 4 kV, not noticeable. Same thing for mass, right? If you change mass by, let's say, just 10 or 20%, not going to make a change. And that takes time to figure out, right? Because sometimes I'll look at an image and I'll say, you need to double your exposure or sometimes quadruple your exposure. And it takes time to, to learn those things because what you don't want to do is go up a little bit and, and then take an x-ray, which is an exposure to the patient, and then do it again and again and again until it's right. In lab, you can x-ray the phantoms till you know, they talk to you, which they won't. So they won't scream if you expose them over and over and over again, but this is something we don't want to do in real life. So at least a 35% change in mass or a 5% change in KV. Oh, here's something I hate. You'll see technologists do this too. They'll change the mass and the KV. They'll be like, a little bit of that, a little bit of that. It's not like, you know, sprinkling ingredients in your soup, right? <laughs> um, it really should be one or the other. Um, and I'm guilty. I've done this at times. Really, the only time you would do that is maybe if your exposure was so low uh, or if you didn't have significant KV to penetrate, then you would go up in your KV till you get to the point where you know you'll penetrate the part and then maybe add some mass. But people that just kind of click the mass button a couple times and then add some KV, it's really hard to figure out what your new exposure is going to be. How would you do it? You'd have to like do one at a time and then which one would you do first? Because right? the number might be different. If you actually try to, you know, <laughs> figure out what they're doing. <clears throat> you've seen this, right? Well, maybe not this exact image, but you've seen these terms in, in patient care. So I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but essentially we can classify body types into these four major areas. We have stenic, hypostenic, asthenic, and hypersthenic. And this is kind of what they mean, right? So stenic is where you want to be in your life, technically, right? You want to be average and strong and healthy, right? Um, hypo means low. So this is just kind of below stenic, hyposthenic, right? So pretty healthy, but, but not, not too bad. Asthenic, so A means not, right? So basically, not stenic is the opposite of stenic, which is bad. So instead of strong and, and healthy, you're ill and, and not good health. And hypersthenic is the opposite of hypo. Hyper is you have excess fat, basically you're overweight. Uh, your torso might be barrel-like, and those patients are the most difficult. Uh, I mentioned them in a way when we talked about collimation. They're the ones that people are afraid to collimate on, so they leave everything open because the object or the patient themselves are bigger. Right. Um, so in my years of taking x-rays, I would recognize these things. I might never put the term, at least not consciously, I'm like, Oh, here comes a hypersthenic patient. <laughs> but I probably know, right? Like more KB. For hypersthenic. Uh, this is a pretty interesting book. I'm sorry. Well, it's in the book. Animation from the book. Or diagram from the book. So we have some torso shapes here. A. Uh, is a premature infant, and they're nearly round, which is kind of good to know because do you change your technique between the AP chest and the lateral chest? Not so much. If they're kind of like a tin can, 
Now, whichever way you turn them, it's the same thickness. The older you are, of course, that changes, right? Hopefully. Uh, what else do we have? A healthy toddler. So you become more oval, right? That kind of makes sense. So the way this is, is the head is like coming out of here and the feet are going into the screen, right? So this is like abdominal cross section. C is an average adult, but you know, if a kid is like an adult, then they get an adult technique, right? So, I mean, when I walk into like junior high school and I'm not a big guy, but there's lots of people that are not adults. I like to consider myself one and they're a lot bigger than me. So don't, don't get confused necessarily between, you know, adolescent and adult. It's all about thickness and pathology. And last on here, we have fluid. This is the toughest one. Because, well, here they're showing you that it's gone up from 22 to 30 centimeters, so eight centimeters. Um, but the reality is if it's fluid, it's one technique. If it's air, it's another technique. So how do you know when it's filled? With? Helps to read the, re the requisition, right? Because maybe they have told you what the issue is. So you have to go beyond what the order is. Order a KUB. For what? And maybe they don't tell you. I mean, I've seen chest x-ray, and, and the reason why you're doing a chest x-ray is headache. OK? Or chest x-ray altered mental status. OK, probably not going to help me too much with my technique might help me, you know, stay alive. Okay. Yes, we x-ray some people that can be difficult at times. Don't worry, one day you'll do a portable in the psych unit and they will have to let you in and they'll watch kind of what you're doing and you hope not to get trapped. <laughs> no, it's not so bad. What's more difficult is patients that have handcuffs on and stuff like that. Uh, so where does the calipers really fail us? So you can see I'm not a big fan of the calipers. Is you have, you know, 86 year old muscle and then you have him. All right. Might have the same circumference if you kind of measure around my bicep, but, uh, Muscle and the fibers that make up the muscle are less radiolucent. In other words, they're more dense. They have an average atomic number that's higher, and you're going to need to increase your exposure, sometimes quite a bit, right? 35 to 50% increase, right? Just based on muscles, right? Um, so it's not just size, right? Because there's a difference between someone that's just, let's say, morbidly obese, and then someone who is an athletic football player that's just muscle, right? Um, they get a different technique, higher. And as you get older, you get wiser. And the other good thing about getting older is you need less exposure. That's one good reason to get old. That's probably the only good reason. Um, so you lose calcium in your bones. So average atomic number again is gonna go down. So older folks don't need as much radiation, right? Um, luckily, we're in a digital age where if you use too much radiation, chances are your image still algorithmically comes out or can be windowed and leveled adequately to change your brightness levels. But um, back with screen film technology, if you did not use lower KV, you definitely over penetrated. So there's a difference between adequately penetrating and over penetrating. 
apart, right? So this could easily lead to overpenetration. One of the things that I think should be in this overall lecture is the use of automatic exposure control, or AEC, that we start off talking about next year in the spring. Um, but real quick, AEC essentially turns off the radiation after the part has been exposed. So there are cells that feel the radiation from the remnant beam, right? They feel the radiation and they trigger the generator to turn off and then your exposure stops. So there are a lot of pitfalls to using AEC. Your positioning has to be dead on accurate for it to work well, but it's a great tool because it takes into account what the calipers are not able to account for. So less radiation for you guys. Children, children are difficult. Is that all I can say about children? Uh, the techniques are, are, are different. Collimation is of utmost importance. The, the hardest thing is that, and I guess maybe it makes sense, they're the hardest sometimes patients that we have in terms of your positioning and your alignment and your collimation, yet they are the ones that most departments focus on in terms of radiation protection. So it all makes sense, but it seems like you have to pay the most attention to the hardest thing. I guess that makes sense also. Um, so you have to shield, and in many institutions, you have to show the shield. So there has to be something on the radiograph itself to prove that there was shielding. And they're not videotaping every procedure you do, so they can't go back to the, the videotape. Uh, and you have to collimate, and in many cases, you have to show the evidence of collimation. We talked about this last week. So it makes it, makes it tough. All, all at the same time, the patient is moving around, maybe. So it's tough. Right. Um, we had in Cornell when I was there, I don't know if they still have, they had a pediatric radiology department. And I know Columbia Presbyterian has like a big department. Um, and it helps because the rooms are nice. They're, they paint on them and there's like Sesame Street stuff. And, you know, uh, but, and, and they have all the right sponges, molded sponges and different things that they can use. They have all the tools usually, which is helpful. But when they come into the emergency room, you don't have such nice equipment sometimes, right, to, to use. Picostat, if you're doing a chest, but that's only good for chests. Picostat not gonna help you if you're trying to do AP and lateral foot. Yeah. Uh, so this should be of no surprise, right? Absorption is gonna be based on the different materials that we're traveling through. And often you're traveling through a lot of these at the same time. It's not just bone, it's bone and fat. In case of chests, it's bone, fat, and air. And maybe metal if they have staples in there. Um, I think this is pointing to, what is this pointing to? Uh, nothing. Uh, I thought it was pointing to maybe staples. It's actually pointing to psoas muscles kind of going down here. You see this like sort of triangle. A um, little bit of gallbladder that it's trying to point to. There's, there's um, fecal matter inside of large intestine, transverse going across. Have you done the intestine yet? Uh, so there are five, basically, right? You can break this all down into five, gas, fat. So, you know, you have gas uh, buildup sometimes and air buildup in your joints as well, not just in your chest and in your colon and in your stomach that you would typically think about. Uh, fat is all over the place. Fluids 
bone, of course, that's, that's our thing, right? Um, but metal, right? Um, patient has surgery, it could be a metal prosthesis, it could be uh, an aneurysm clip, uh, it could be anything, right? Uh, hopefully it's part of the patient and not an artifact from a snap or something left on the table or who knows what. Um, residual barium, by the way, will also, not residual, that's probably not the best word. Residual means like barium that's stuck in the patient. And that's possible too, right? Um, if they go for an x-ray right after uh, some barium work, there may be some residual uh, barium that shows up on an image. Did you guys, look, guys learn about barium studies yet? Or is that more yeah, next? What did you learn? And they do scalp films for Scalp films. She, she probably won't say it because she's too nice. Scalp films for FOS. I know what you're saying. Okay, I won't describe that. It's a public YouTube video. So yeah, um, <clears throat> patients have to prep for certain procedures. They have to try to clean their colon. If their colon is not clean, it disrupts the images uh, and you don't get as nice of a study. And things could be hiding, like a little polyp or who knows what. So not good. And I kind of alluded to this a little earlier. We're lucky now that we're in the digital world that we can correct for both lower and higher exposures, mostly for higher exposures. If the image is low and there's a lot of noise, there's only so much noise you can clean up digitally. But we can adjust the contrast by doing something known as windowing. So when you window the contrast, you are essentially changing the grayscale. It's kind of like an accordion, right? If it's all the way out and you have a long scale and you have lots of grays, you can window that and change your scale of contrast as you make it shorter and shorter, contrast goes up, it gets more black white. And I don't know if I like this term, but I use it all the time. It gets more contrasty, right? It kind of jumps out at you more. Leveling is different. Leveling will change the brightness level, right? Um, and very often, uh, if you played with the CR or, or with the DR rooms, uh, when you move the mouse in one direction, you're windowing. When you move it left to right, let's say, versus vertical, you're changing the level. Right? And it's really a combination of those two that make the images uh, more appropriate. But a word of advice here. You should not window and level everything to how you think you like it. You will see technologists do this as well. If the image was produced with the adequate penetration, right? In other words, good technique and your S number or exposure indicator is in the correct range, there should be very little reason to manipulate the image, right? You have, based on what I just said, provided enough information so the radiologist can do the windowing and leveling. Besides that, their particular monitor is most likely very different from the viewing station that you are looking at. You know the one thing you will actually lose that we have an advantage here at school is here, when we send from the CR plate reader or in the DR room, DR rooms to the monitor, uh, you can see the image get better. And in the hospital, most likely you don't see that. You only have the technologist station. And unless you later on go to a pack station and pull up an image that you did, and this thing is not right next to you to see all the time. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. You won't really know what your image looks like. Not only will you not know the contrast and brightness levels that they have and can manipulate, you also don't have the size. Usually your monitor is small. The advantage that you also had in the film environment was a 1417 that you saw that came out of a processor was the same exact image that the radiologist or the physician in the ER maybe also saw, right? It just went into a folder, moved around a little bit and got to them. 
You don't have that anymore. Sometimes you have a little screen on a monitor that's like 200 bucks versus $20,000. And that's a low number. So my point on that is you shouldn't really be changing the technique constantly. Don't think you have to Photoshop everything. Contrast uh, is something we have to be thinking about. It's one of the best named things we have in radiology. Contrast media improves contrast. So I like the name. Okay. Essentially, it absorbs more radiation than surrounding tissues. It's kind of like liquid metal. It's going to increase the photoelectric effect in that area because basically things don't penetrate the metal. So it shows up very, very bright, kind of the same way bone shows up bright compared to other substances. There's two types. There's the positive and the negative. Negative is cheap, literally. Doesn't cost that much if you pump air into someone. And the little carbon dioxide pellets and granules that they sometimes give people almost in like a shot glass kind of thing to pop in. Um, they, they create like an effervescence like Alka-Seltzer and they put carbon dioxide uh, into the patient, not enough to kill them, right? Um, don't cost nearly as much money as the positive. So the positive agents are designed to turn things bright and make them white, like what we've been kind of talking about. Negative makes things darker, negative contrast. Um, now, because positive charge uh, contrast agents are like liquid metal, it means our KV needs to be higher, right? 80 to 100. Negative uh, contrast agents, I don't think you have to change your technique at all. States of respiration. All you need to understand about this slide is where is the diaphragm? So the diaphragm is this big muscle, right? And if it's in the way of whatever you're looking at, you need to increase your exposure. It's as if the patient got bigger. So our diaphragm is designed to kind of open up our lungs or push air out. So if you take a deep breath, you want more air, correct? So diaphragm goes down to open up your lung cavity. It's out of the way. So we do most of our chest x-rays on inspiration, taking a deep breath, just for that reason, right? We also get a better view of uh, a possible superimposing of the diaphragm on the lower ribs, right? That's really the two reasons to take in a deep breath and hold it. Um, you'll also get better contrast, I guess, because you have more air. Um, only time you don't do uh, inspiration, I shouldn't say the only time, but one of the few that you could probably remember is in the case of a pneumothorax uh, or PTX, which is the acronym. You'll get to learn all the acronyms and because when the requisitions come, they might give you the history that I told you to look at, but if you don't understand the acronyms, then uh, not so good. Like COPD. COPD, anyone? No? Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Yeah. <laughs> Any other good ones? There's lots of good ones out there. And, so, and sometimes physicians make their own up. And you're like, what is this? And then, and then you don't know. All right. Uh, pneumonia. Usually they write that one up. I don't know, is there, is there pneumonia? PE would be a pleural fusion. How about cystic fibrosis? CF maybe? But there are ones that make less sense also, where the, where the, where the letters don't match up. I have to think about it for a minute. Uh, so not only will you get a better view uh, of the lungs, but Chances are you'll have less motion if they're not breathing, right? 
Uh, and I think we talked about the same thing here. Um, so if you do a view on expiration, what's going to happen is diaphragm is going to go up, but you still want to adequately penetrate, so you're going to have to increase your exposure. Not double, not double your exposure, but increase. Okay. I think we can keep going. Pathology. So pathology will break up into two areas for us because they help us determine whether we're going to use more radiation or less radiation. So essentially, if it's pathology that's considered additive, that means we need to increase our exposure. If it's destructive, like osteoporosis, which is kind of leading to bone mineral loss, then you reduce your exposure. I mean, pathology can break up into lots of different categories, but in terms of exposure technique, it's these two. And again, you guys are lucky because this doesn't, I don't want to say it doesn't matter as much, but the likelihood of the digital system correcting for under or overexposure is so much greater than having zero corrective ability with film. Think about it. We said earlier that four to six kV, not two kV, four, six, eight kV difference uh, can make a noticeable difference on the image. In film world, that means if you're off four, five, six kV, you could be doomed, right? Potentially. They haven't figured out how to automate positioning just yet. If they do, we're in trouble. But don't laugh. How much positioning is there in CAT scan? I've been teaching CAT scan for like 10 years, at least, no, more than that. And I don't talk about positioning really at all. Lay down. <laughs> don't move. The part of interest goes into the middle of the circle. Much harder to do like an oblique elbow than CT scan, honestly, from a positioning standpoint at least. So in an additive condition, like we said, uh, it can be quite influential. I mean, take a look at this. Fluid in the lung, all of a sudden, it's a thousand times the tissue density of what a normal aerated lung is. What does this mean? Additive conditions can be difficult for our technique because if you don't use enough radiation, you get noise and there goes your contrast. Repeat. Um, Cardiomegaly, enlarged heart, PE. That's just a terrible image to begin with, even without the other stuff. Probably a portable image. Ribs are not supposed to be like that vertical almost in here. Clavicles are not in a good place. The clavicles also don't look like they're straight. This one's down here and this one's up here. So patients tilted, sternal clavicular joints are not equidistant from the spinous processes. I'm getting all positioning today. <laughs> Yuck. I, I taught positioning though, once, twice. I can't remember how many times I taught it. So this is by far not the full list, right? But these are the main ones. 
I mean, but take a look. You know, if you find out that the heart is enlarged, and this is something that can be on the requisition, because a lot of times people get x-rays not just once. They already have, you know, something that's been diagnosed, and you know, a week goes by or a day, and it's already known. They're just taking another x-ray for whatever reason. So it's not like you don't always have, or I should say never have any information to go on. I mean, maybe initially, if that's the first time patient's uh, in there, uh, pulmonary edema, that's a big increase, ascites, right? So when a guy comes into the ER and they look pregnant, it's ascites, most likely. <laughs> a big fluid build up, right? And it's not dis dispersed to the rest of the abdomen. It's like they look pregnant. So unless it's sci-fi or something has really changed with the world, uh, it's ascites. Uh, Paget's disease. I don't know why this one is on here. Well, I, I, okay, no, that's not true. Paget's is the opposite of osteoporosis. Um, but it's not a major increase in, in exposure. Um, so there you go. Uh, a lot of these kind of make sense, right? If they seem like they're adding, then they're adding. Destructive, right? This is the opposite, right? This is where we need to reduce our exposure by around 8 kV or 35 minutes. Emphysema. Bowel obstruction, I'm not so sure about that one. Um, osteoporosis, malacia is a softening. This is where your medical terminology has to come in handy. Air, where it's not supposed to be. Hodgkin's disease, I don't really know enough about it. But you don't have to know everything about the disease to know whether to increase your exposure or not. Whoops. Trauma. So trauma creates swelling in many cases. Uh, you need to increase your technique. If my ankle, after I broke it a few years ago, uh, looked completely different from my other ankle. Uh, technique definitely changed. Um, blood, especially when it pools in a certain area, uh, will really increase. Uh, but we saw what we saw the uh, what was the chest X-ray we saw before? Pleural effusion, right? A thousand times more. So blood is kind of like that, right? So when it pools in a particular area, especially in your head. Um, you're going to want to increase your technique. Um, a lot. This is just really terrible. I feel sorry for this person. This whole thing is supposed to look like a pumpkin. And it's like missing an eye. And everything's shifted off the midline. So you like immediately know something's wrong when the left half is basically not symmetrical with the right half. Soft tissue. You know, uh, a lot of people come in because they swallow like a fish bone or something like that. I had that happen to me once. It was really terrible. I didn't need, eventually I, I must have loosened up and went down because I never had to like have an x-ray and then life got better at some point. <laughs> but um, if it doesn't and it's really stuck, you got to go in and, and and have it diagnosed so they can figure out where it is and maybe they can go get it. Um, but they used to do what was known as a soft tissue neck because if you use the same technique that you would normally use for the C-spine, then you would over penetrate the soft tissue anterior to that and it would not come out. They used to order, they probably don't anymore unless it's an older physician. Uh, and maybe they'll, maybe they'll order it this way anyway, just to clue you in but they used to be on the requisition, it would say soft tissue neck. In fact, some of the old requisitions that have little check boxes on them still have that. Um, now you can pretty much use the same technique that you would normally use. And that's a good example of when the radiologist really should use the power of windowing and leveling, right? So they can suddenly 
make this area a little bit easier to see. Um, but if you don't have that ability, uh, we would have gone down about 20%. So a fifth of what you would normally use on C-spine, you go down. Because again, in the film world, uh, you couldn't just lighten up a particular area of the film. It just kind of was what it was. Yeah, that's terrible. Now this has changed, right? Plaster is pretty much gone. Anyone get a plaster cast? Yeah, recently? Yeah, they, they have pretty much gone away because now they have all these cool boots. Of course, you can't draw pictures on the boots, you know, the way you could with plaster. Um, but if you should see this, or if you decide to take x-rays in, um, I forget which country in Africa that a friend of mine went to to work with their x-ray department. But whichever country it was, they were like decades behind us. And they were using really old stuff and including plastic. Right. Um, you would have to increase your exposure a lot, right? Uh, it was four times the mass. That's huge, right? Four times the mass. Um, and it would vary a little bit whether it was wet or dry. But this is kind of where we are now. Right? Fiberglass, no change. Splints. First of all, we don't take them off for our x-rays. And what's really interesting is you might change your technique where the splint is, but keep it the same where it isn't. What do I mean by this? I need someone to lay. Um, all right, calisthenics time. If I have a splint up here, but one's on top and one's on the bottom, when I turn the patient lateral, where's the splint? No longer, it's on the side. So you don't need to change your technique. It's as if they didn't have a splint. Right, so you don't want to go into this like I need to increase my technique and then just leave it increased for every single view. It depends on what you're doing. Right. Um, with a cast, it, you know, pretty much goes all the way around. You don't have to think that way. Uh, all of these, unfortunately, are not as radiolucent as we would like. I mean, you've seen even the sponges show up. Right. So uh, pieces of wood and, and uh, metal splints uh, show up. And what gets really weird is the metal splints, a lot of them have like little holes in them. So parts of the image look more adequately penetrated than other parts. Yeah, I mean, we should get like, we should put some splints on some phantoms. May I ask Jody Ann if she could buy us some like, weird splints and stuff. Uh, this is pretty cool though, with the military look. What was that? A lot of those phantoms need a splint. Oh, we do have a few phantoms that, that need some help. Um, the, the hardest part here should not be the technique anymore. The hardest part should now be how do we position when the patient can't extend fully uh, or I'm getting really positioning today, like abduct in the right way. Um, yeah, you will see all these things. You will realize how much we didn't do for you here. Right? Unfortunately, but that's why we have five clinical rotations. Every semester you're in clinic, except this one. So I will stop this. Sayonara. <laughs>